people to this is Arnold and he's gonna get he's our guest speaker so um, I'm gonna introduce him there you are <laughs> and he's gonna get started all right I'm sure I say Damaris. I anglicize it. You yeah. anglicize it, yes. Damaris. Say, How do you say it in Demaris. French? It's, it's French. No? Where's the Demaris? Okay. Definitely, we needed Christine here to uh, to do the proper pronunciation. Uh, she's our French. Uh, well, who is French in here? Not many people admit it. No. <laughs> I'm 100 percent French, by the way. Oh, you are. I'm 100 okay. French. Wow, oh, that's awesome. And, and so we can expect you to speak United French. Uh, yeah, yeah. Part of the, I don't know what they would call that when you speak French and English. Like for me, I speak Spanish and English at the same time. Yeah, so it's English. <laughs> no, I, there's a phrase for speaking Spanish and English, yeah. but yes. in one French, sentence, yes. it's called yeah. Spanglish. Yeah. I don't know if there's Frenchlish. French. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have multiple cultures and multiple languages that we can all enjoy, and um, which is awesome. So um, I'm going to let him come up, as I usually do, to speak about what he's done. But he seems to have such a lucrative uh, career. If you read off our, our website, I think he's worked for major uh, fashion houses, um, which gives him quite a, uh, what do you call it? He has an eye for style. <laughs> and I guess that's the French in him, right? So um, let me not um, delay, but let's have uh, Arnold Dim. Demacre. Demacre. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Thank you for always hoping I'll get some at the end. <laughs> and everybody hear me because I wasn't going to use this, but my voice is going away because of the pollen. I'm not sick, and the pollen has a way of doing that. Anyway, um, don't believe anything you read on the website about me. My publicist wrote all of this. <laughs> the only thing that's true is I was born in 52. <laughs> Other than that, good year. it's a good year, and we were talking about it earlier. I, I share a birthday with John Singh. Not too shabby either. Nice. Not too shabby. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. You'll not remember anything about what I talk about today except that I share a with <laughs> And that's the truth of it all. And I want to thank you for having me come. I would not have come unless Kate personally invited me to come. And so I don't understand why you need a man to come speak to a women's organization. I think you have plenty of women that could speak. But anyway, be that as it may, I'm very happy to be here. And, um, you know, my wife and I now raise up. I'm sorry? I said, are you intimidated by us? No. <laughs> I, worked, I worked for Liz Claymore. There are like four men out of four million men, uh, women. And I literally reported to the sixth highest paid woman in the world. So I'm not intimidated by women at all. And her name is Nina Macklemore. She now owns her own company and she dresses uh, like Hillary Clinton. And she does that. She designs clothing for all the politicians. That's what she does. And um, anyway, I uh, was born to a family of artistic people. I'm going to say more than artisans. My grandfather painted. Uh, my grandfather painted on silk. My grandfather raised me, by the way. The joke is if you had a kid like me, you'd give me away too. My grandfather uh, decided that he wanted to raise me. He was very paternal. We're very French. And so I went to live with my grandfather and my grandmother. And my grandfather was a frustrated artist. He had a very successful jewelry company, and uh, but he was a frustrated artist. He painted, and when he could see that I showed any sign of being interested in artwork, he encouraged me to become a full-time artist. And he arranged for me, believe it or not, to attend the Olive School of Design. And the only class they had for somebody my age 
was a preparatory class for college. It was all high school students that were building portfolios so that they could eventually apply to RISD. I was in grammar school. I don't know who my grandfather paid off, which I'm sure he did, but I got in. <laughs> Hated RISD, absolutely hated it, and I decided to go to business school, and I got an MBA. And but I always had that bent of artistic side. I always wanted to do that, and it was my good fortune to get into the fashion industry because I was working in a design department in a company uh, while I was in college. I could illustrate, so they had me working in the design department. I was an apprentice to a designer. I didn't design; all I did was do their, her drawings. Great lady. And, but I had to learn how to do watercolor. And so I had I never used watercolor. She showed me how to do it. So on weekends, plus my homework for college, I'd go home and do watercolor. And the um, I, what I was doing is uh, uh, animals. I was doing birds and wildlife and all this sort of thing. And my parents had a place up in Maine, and they brought it up to a man up there that owned a gallery. And he said that he would sell as much as I could, as much as they could bring him. Never met, I never met the man, nor did he ever meet me. Every time my parents would go up to Maine, they bring paintings, and I paid for five years of college in 11 months. Oh, I paid all of my college completely from what I sold in watercolors in Maine. <coughs> then I decided, I met my wife. My wife was a bathing suit model. Everything's in the fashion industry. And my wife's a bathing suit model. She was a model until she was 34. Oh. And we got married, and never saw me paint, never saw me do anything, never saw me do artwork or anything. Had no idea that I could do any of this stuff other than, because I was an executive, I was vice president of a corporation at the time. And um, so I started, so we had an exchange student, my wife and I uh, took an exchange student, and our exchange students, we had 30 of them, that's how crazy we are. We had 30 exchange students over a number of years. And when our first exchange student went home, we asked him what he would like for Christmas. We'd like to send it to him because they usually go home at the end of the summer, like August or whatever. And he said, I want a painting from you. And I thought to myself, well, that's a weird one. He said, well, I know that you're used to paint, but that would mean a lot to me if you would do a painting. So I did a painting, and my wife is like looking at this thing and like, why don't you paint? <laughs> why do you not paint? She says to me, oh, because I'm too busy traveling. I used to go around the world four times a year. I didn't have time to paint. And, and by the way, I was working 10, 12, whatever number of hours. I did really not stop painting seriously until I bought my own company and I moved to Cape Cod. Because I, I worked in New York. I worked, I worked for everybody. You name them. I have been. I have lived the life that all of you would have liked to have lived. I've been to all the fashion shows in Paris. I used to get tickets to the mall. We all used to stay, all of us in the industry used to stay at the Intercontinental because we trade tickets. So I get to go to Valentino shows. My people used to go to the Donna Karen shows in New York because I would trade tickets with them. We used to go to these shows. You couldn't buy these tickets. They were not available. And I uh, traveled all over the world. I never had time. But I decided we bought a house on Cape Cod. And for Christmas, my wife says to me, you know, your son wants to get you something. For Christmas, and he has lots. My son has lots of rules, and you can't get clothing, you can't get you know, oh, all that stuff. So I said, "You know what I want? I want canvases and oil paint." She says, "I have no idea." She says, "What to buy you?" I said, "Neither do I. I have no idea. I really never painted oil." So she said to me, "I said, you know what? Go to a really high-end art store, which they used to be. Now there aren't any, but." Go to a really good, don't worry, they'll sell you expensive stuff. I said, buy good quality, because even when you do, do watercolor, you want the very best of quality to work with. So, my wife went out with my son, they had a ball, and in February, I did my very first painting. It was at the first one, and then the second one was four by five feet, and the very second oil painting. And my wife, at that point, owned decorating centers. And so, we were asked by a girlfriend of hers who owned another decorating center who used to subcontract through my wife. They had, you know how they have these design showcases? Well, they got this huge mansion. And they, you have to bid on the room, and they got the living room, and the room was huge. So she had seen my work, and she said, I'd love to put your paintings in my living room in this thing. And mind you, 
I have, this is like, I'm not taking any of this seriously. I'm not in any organizations. I'm not talking to anybody. Nothing. I sold my first painting for $5,000. It sold, there was a bidding war on the others because the people came in and they bought it the, the minute the door, there was a cocktail party to show the house off. And then the day it opened, you could actually buy stuff. The people were standing at the door so they would not miss that first painting. And then there was a bidding war for the rest of them. Now my son, who had, by the way, an MBA of MBAs, he owns seven companies, and currently doing an IPO, and he's like on his calculator, you know, he's like telling me, Dad, quit your job. I'm like, I own the company. I'm like, it's not so easy to quit your job. So anyway, that was my story. Then from there, I was very lucky. I used to do a lot of philanthropic work, which I still kind of do, but I'm kind of fading on that. I used to do a lot of work with different organizations raising money. And I, raised, I had one organization, which is hospice, which we've used on a number of occasions for my family. And I helped them raise literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. This woman, who was the head of the event, she was the event coordinator. And I became very good friends. We worked together for almost three years, not knowing that she is a renowned New England artist. Oh. And so I told her that I painted one day, and that was the end of that. She became my mentor, and Arnold DeMaris, or Arnold, as the artist is known, was born. And that's exactly what happened. She just created me, and she called up, I mean, she called the Copley Society, she called the Cape Cod Artist Association. I was asked to be on the board of everything, and that's, believe it or not, how the business started. The only good news of this is there is like, the gallery on Cape Cod, which is called Trees Place, was considered to be one of the top 100 in the United States. I got in there before she did. <laughs> <laughs> I got into Trees Place before she did. Okay, so now let's start talking now about the history. I'm going to talk about my paintings and basically my concept. Um, it very, very early on, um, first of all, I was born on the coast of New England and basically spent my whole life on the ocean. Um, we either had a house on the ocean or whatever. Um, did they you know Block Island, Rhode Island? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. You've been on Block Island? You know Dead Eye Dicks? My uncle was Dead Eye. And they owned, at one point, my aunt, my uncle owned 60% of that island. And but they had like the founding families. And um, so it was a natural thing for me to paint boats. And so I just loved painting boats. And all the artists that I sort of admired on Cape Cod were marina. So I started to paint both, and I became a member of the American Society of Marine Painters, and which is probably in the United States so the benchmark. And I was very lucky to become a member. And I only became a member because I had a show at my gallery in Florida with the president. I happened to have a two-man show with him, and he's like, "Oh, aren't you a member?" And I'm like, "Yeah, hey, come on in, come on in. Don't be shy." No, don't be sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's got a story. Anyway, so I started to do boats, and I started to do antique or historical boats. Well, what happens is you start, you sort of get a genre about your work, and the gallery, of course, like I said, I mentioned, I mentioned Trees Place now by accident. But when you get into a really good gallery, such as that, and Julian at the time owned it, he actually built artists. I mean, he would bring in unknown people and build their careers. He really, really would. And as a result of that, he said, you know, he kind of framed my work and said, you really should feature yourself on working off work because your boats are so perfect. Now, I'm going to tell a cute little story about the American society. I used to go into the museum shows. They have shows. And um, what they do is you get juried into the show, okay? And then they have a person that looks, this is years ago, not today. Years ago, they had people, they would call them rivet counters. And they would make sure that your rigging was correct. And, you know, all, this, all the stuff on your boats were correct. They don't do this anymore. And um, they're much more involved in the world of art. And the amazing, amazing artists that belong to this place are just breathtaking. Anyway, um, I started to do marine work. I did a number of shows. I've had paintings that have traveled the country with them. Um, I have one which I... Debated whether I should bring it up. I tried to bring a little bit larger paintings, but such that I could move them. Um, ones that had been in, on tour on like 15 museums with the American Society. Um, I'm going to start talking about this particular painting because 
This, and I'm not going to tell you stories of each one, but this one just happens to be interesting. A very, a, a very famous artist in New England, Robert Rock. Um, his wife um, is an organizer on Cape Cod for different events. And this, she asked me if I would be the honest of record for the largest regatta of cat, cat boats in the United States. And so, um, I'll make the story short. I flew up to Mystic, Connecticut, where they have a living museum where they restore antique boats. That's the one that had the big fire not too long ago. If you saw it on the news, it made national headlines. And um, I flew up there because they have the quintessential marshal. And I wanted to take pictures of it, which is that boat. And um, you become the artist of record, and what you do is you just donate the image. They have prints made, and they give them away as awards. And the chances are you will sell the painting, but I didn't want to sell it. Um, I am a traditional artist, very, very classically trained, in the sense that I'm self-taught. But I've read literally a thousand books. And when I say read a thousand, I probably read ten, but I've read them a hundred times each. <laughs> and I have books. I have books that I read and I throw them away. I have other books that I read every single year. I reread them because. I used to teach years ago, I taught. And one of the things you learn when you teach is that the students have to be ready to hear what you're saying. They have to hear, they have to be, you can talk and say something over and over and over again. But if they're not ready to receive that information because their art level or their, their level of understanding is not there yet, um, you have to keep repeating it until they hear it. Well, reading a book is the same way. I mean, Edgar Payne's book, every time I read that book, I learned something from that book. It's quite this thick. And it's, you know, my wife won't let me take it on vacation anymore because it depressed. Uh, and I used to take it on vacation. Every time we go away, she said, let me check your luggage. You're not taking that book. <laughs> and because it, I love the book so much. And what it does is it puts me in this sort of mood to think about what's being said. I'm classically trained in the sense of thinking about the story, the story, the story, the color variations and all the sort of thing that you learn from the But I mean, what I try to do is I try to paint, if it's not noticeable, realism, almost to the point of hyper realism. And I talk about this all the time because uh, when you paint, and it just translates into the other subject matter, which I do, which I like this little turtle right here, this little guy. I mean, what I try to do is I try to use it in all the different areas that I paint. I try to do it, do it as realistically as possible. Um, one of the things that I, when I teach, I talk about all the time is the story of color recession. And I think that is so important. You cannot talk about it enough. I don't care if you paint the most exotic, abstract, whatever. If you don't understand the fundamentals of art, you don't understand, you know, bringing the eye into the painting, people, keep people in the painting, all of those, it doesn't matter what you paint. It doesn't really matter. I used to sponsor, I was very lucky, one of my students owned a travel company, and uh, his name was Stephen Knight, and one, he was a student of mine for a number of years, great painter, great guy, and uh, owned a travel company, and said to me, you should take your show on the road, you should really like, we should all go to France, and um, so I said, well, I'm not writing, I'm not smart enough to do like all the travel arrangements, and all. he said, don't worry about it, I have staff, and he said, I'll, you know, we'll make a trip, we'll all go, sold out, Within an hour, we were going to France. And, um, you know, you go, and you, it's so funny because you do these kinds of things, then you realize, do I really want to do this and have, a, you know, like a tornado of people behind me? You know, it just, when you are out there and you are just totally immersed in doing these kinds of things, it's amazing what comes to you, you know, what, what you learn and all the pieces of the puzzle that you experience. And, you know, I was never a great plain air painter because I'm really a studio artist. I really am. But I was teaching people to paint plain air. And, you know, it was sort of like, it's amazing that being forced into that taught me so much. It really, really did. And I think keeping yourself fresh with different experiences, um, who, here consider, who considers themselves an artist in this room? By showing hands. Okay. Who? Oh, you don't consider. I have a hard time with it. I do too. <laughs> yeah. I do too. My husband refers to me as a hobbyist, and I get insulted by it. But I have a hard time, like. Why it? Where are you from? Why it? 
<laughs> Born and raised in Brooklyn. But Brooklyn. Oh, God, God bless you. Right. God bless you. You never lose the answer. You never Like me. Yeah. Like me. And he said, you can take the girl out of Brooklyn. Exactly. You can take Brooklyn this out of Brooklyn. This is what living next to the Kennedys will get you. You'll talk like this. <laughs> well, people me confuse me with Boston people, and I go, you don't know the accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, I, I, it's hard. That's like, you know, I was thrilled that my kite was accepted in our yeah. exhibit. Yeah. And uh, I have friends here who are wonderful and say, you have no confidence in yourself and your work. And I said, well, maybe that makes me an artist. My wife says to me all the time, I'm like, I can't believe they spend that kind of money. Yeah. <laughs> Patty says to me, you know Patty says to me? Trust me, they don't spend that money because they like you. <laughs> she said, These people can afford to have anything they want and they chose to buy you. And it, it, to a degree, that's true. And like I said, I've been very, very fortunate as well, being in incredible galleries, being presented by incredible people, and playing the game to a degree, you know, belonging to organizations such as this, and being with other people, you learn by accident. You create that vocabulary, just having lunch and conversations and all of that, listening to speakers on a regular basis. And um, you know, it's so many people you know, that don't do all of these things, it just amazes me. Um, one, let's go back to color recession. Color recession is making things believable to give that sense of depth in painting. And let me tell you, there's so much written on it, but there's so little that is really, really, really good. If you want to buy a book that's like Johnny Went Up the Hill, up, 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 it's Margaret Kessler's book. Margaret Kessler, that's with a K, and it is a painting about a landscape. It literally is like Johnny went up the hill, up, up, up. On Cape Cod, they used to sock them by the gross because people would tell everybody and everybody would run down to the store and they'd say, like, this one book just keeps selling and selling. And that's because I think it's one of the greatest books because she talks about color recession and she does it in such a simplistic way with an example that I think it's great. Because, you know, people don't, a lot of people understand that, you know, yeah, you pull color out, but the color doesn't only get pulled out. You don't pull out just the warm colors. The colors actually change as they go further into the distance. And they get cooler and they get paler. But there are also things when you paint realism that there's no reason why they do what they do. Like, believe it or not, right here, there is a lizard and crimson in that sky. And nobody quite understands, other than the fact that it grays the blue, why it does that. But in fact, if you actually are on location and you're looking out and you're looking out at the sky, you can see that coloration. You can see the reds. And we, I just put the slightest tint of it in, but it's definitely there. Um, the other thing that you, what I try to do is I try to get people, there's a, a line that I used to use where I try to get people to move seamlessly into the emotion of the painting. In other words, when you look at the painting, I don't want you to look at, oh, look at the way the brush strokes are and all of that. That's abstract to me. Many times abstract can be beautiful and powerful and all of that. But then many times, and I'm not saying all the time, a lot of it, it's the brush stroke and it's the brightness of the color that sort of gets you where you're going. Where with realism, you can't cheat. It's like the, it's either right or it's wrong. And to get, to, to look at a piece and just completely be affected by that emotion to be, you know, to, to move you away from it being a painting and say, I know that time of day. I know that moment. I know the color. I can hear the water. That's that's what I try to do. Sometimes I'm okay at it. Other times I'm not. And But that's what I try to do in all of my painting. The other thing is, of course, we all try to capture that one moment. Now, who wants to be a better artist after they leave this room today? Okay. For those who have heard me speak before, you're going to hate me because I'm going to bring out the same old exercise. Jay, I'm going to tell you a little exercise that, size that I learned a long, long time ago. It's called the red ball. It doesn't have to be red. It can be any color you want. But I'm going to tell you something. Anytime you want to create a fabulous color with color range and you want to create a painting with volume, do one of these before you start the painting using the colors that you want to play with in the painting. 
We don't, as artists, we do not paint objects. You don't paint a tree. You don't paint a boat. We don't paint a rock. We paint how light affects that. Now, we all hear that. We're all artists. You probably read the same shtick I did. And, you know, but until you're ready to actually try doing this exercise, you're not going to really be humbled enough to be able to understand the volume that you're trying to create in a painting. Now, every single object, this painting just happens to, I brought this painting specifically because you can see the light and how it shows you the contour of that boat. And that's the wonderful part about boats. They really are a form of sculpture. So you're putting a sculpture in a painting with a landscape. It's sort of like doing a portrait like the Mona Lisa. You put the landscape in the background. This is the same way. It's a portrait of a boat with a land, happens to have a landscape in the background. By the way, just to humble all of us even more, my six-year-old painted that. <laughs> Not mine, my grandson painted that when he was six. And so I have him, I have him do this because I wanted to show him. And you know what? He's done amazing things. By the way, he's a contributing artist at Mount Moaz, and I'm not. And he had a painting on exhibit there. And in a, in a formal exhibit. You know that, right, Kate? And, and um, anyway, the long and the short of the deal is, I just learned YouTube is my best friend. I have to tell you, I wait until my poor wife goes to bed. She reads, God bless her. She goes to bed to read, I think partially because she wants to give me the television. And I watch YouTube and everything about every artist that ever lived. And, you know, even the ones that are so like real fringe. And, you know, what I just learned recently that even the Romans and the Greeks used to use the light source from the upper right hand corner. My wife and I were in Herculaneum less than a year ago. And it's very, very true that even in the tiles, the tile floors and the pictures that they put, they have like little frescoes that are in the walls and all that. The light is always from the upper right hand corner. Um, I think these are tools that if you want to be successful, even if you paint the most abstract work, making people look at it and feel familiar. You know, we've all been around for a few million years as far as creatures. <laughs> We're all used to looking at things in a certain way. We, the sun is up, not down, and all that sort of thing. And I'm not saying you have to do this. But if you try to create a painting and you put the light in a place that makes it easy for the viewer to understand, it's being familiar to you. Now, you can look at this as a variety of different light sources, obviously. But you have to be aware of your light source because you are creating that volume, whether you're creating a sky, whether you're creating whatever, you have to add volume to it. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to show you something. This painting right here shows it very, very well. Do you see the difference from this coloration to this coloration? Mm -hmm. If I had paint, most people paint, and they go right across the cube. <laughs> and I'm telling you that the sky does not do that. There is a light source somewhere in your, you got to choose. You're the artist. You get to do what you want. But if you make it convincing, and once you put that, that source in, everything has to speak to that light source. So I think that even something as subtle as this brings your eye into the subject. I try to do atmosphere, and the atmosphere actually does that. And if you open and close your eyes, that's the greatest tool we have as artists. Opening and closing your eyes. How many people have heard that before? other than from me. <laughs> if you open and close your eyes, it's going to tell you what you're used to looking at. Because not only you, not only your parents, thousands of years back, everybody opened and closed their eyes, and that's how they, the, the brain learned what, you, what you're looking at. And as a result of that, you know, really a few hundred years, you know, beyond where we now make logical decisions, but we're still, you know, we still are trained, our minds are trained, to look at things, and if you keep the light source, you know, I worked for Liz Claiborne, and um, I worked for Liz for a number of years. I started a number of divisions for she and her husband on Altenburg. And Liz used to say, you can create anything you want. Just make it familiar. Don't scare them. You know, always have those pieces that people recognize and understand, so they feel like it's part of them. Your painting has to be the same way. You have to invite people in 
And then it's your job to get them to stay in the painting and keep looking at it and looking at it and be rewarded by looking at it. That's your job. And, you know, all these things are the tools that we use. We call them tricks, if you want. I don't like the word trick. They're tools. Because if we're real artists and we're really good at what we do, we sort of manipulate, you know, like, you know, like, um, you know, you think of like a Van Gogh who, you know, does like all these brush strokes and all of that. Totally different. And yet everybody looks at this and understands because it's familiar to us. It feels familiar to you. It's understandable to you. Um, so who's going to try this? Nobody. I guarantee you. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody, nobody's going to try this. I have to tell you, you know what the other thing is it's going to You know, I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> well, here's the deal. The reason why this is so important is because you know how when you learn how to mix colors, people say, you know, oh, you do these big squares and you do the sheets and you graduate all the reds and then you you've seen this, right? Oh, yeah. Guess what? Do this and you've done it. And it's already worked out for you because if that progression isn't perfect, it doesn't work. And when you get done, you have it. And you can put it alongside the painting that you want to do and you can understand it much better. It really is a fabulous tool. It's a great tool. So don't do it. <laughs> Um, the other thing that I, I'm a real proponent is I love the atmospheric glow. I really, I don't know that any of these paintings necessarily have as much of it as I'd like it to have. This is probably the better of a lot. And I love paintings to have that atmospheric glow because what that does, it reminds us of that time of day, those few moments at dusk. I just did a whole series. I don't know, I don't know how, how much you know about what I do. Every year I do a series of paintings. I only, know, I only do that because I'm not that bright. And so what I do is I come up with a series for myself. And I do um, a whole series of paintings, but they have to tie into each other. It's sort of like designing a line of clothing or a line of jewelry or a line of anything. Because you have to keep your mindset. It, what it does is it helps me, because I'm an idiot, to focus on what I want to create. Now, it, it eliminates all the other things like the static electricity that's around me to focus my energy on this particular type of wall. Because I literally have thousands of photographs from which I look at to inspire me. And so what I do is I try to focus my energy to do one series. Um, Interestingly enough, I don't have one from one of the series here. But, <laughs> but like, for instance, I did the Islands of the Keys. I did all the, I did all my research, which is very fun, by the way. You do all your research for the islands, and then you pick out the ones that are the most traveled, the ones that are most recognized. Because it, you can make believe you're not a merchant, but to a degree you are. You want, you, at least I do. Don't think it's me jazz to love and sell and paint. And so, you know, it's, it's sort of like a rubber stamp. I guess it's my career in the retail industry that has sort of, you know, trained me that, my mental capacity that way. Do I do paintings for myself? I almost bought one today. I just finished another painting just for me. But it's like if I show it to you, then it's not just for me. And so, anyway, the, uh, I don't think I even shared it with Jay. <laughs> and so, anyway, um, I think you have to, it was a value study. It's a very heavy value study. That's another thing. That, I bet you do. They won't even play it. I always do a value study. Almost always. 99% of the time. Do you know what value study is? Exactly. Nobody does them. And so, like, nobody does thumbnails. I'm going to tell you. Do you know the name Christopher Blossom? He's an amazing, look him up, what are you saying now? Christopher Blossom, amazing artist. He is like the artist's artist. Well, Christopher Blossom does one workshop a year, one. And I missed the sign up day. And I wanted to go to it desperately. Now, Christopher Blossom and I happened to be in a gallery together here in Florida. So he knew who I was. And so I called him in Connecticut. He lived in Connecticut with his wife and children. And I called him, I said, I missed the sign up day. He goes, just come. Just come. He I'm said, I'm having a deja vu. What? I'm having a deja vu. I feel like you've given us this name and you missed the workshop and all that. I'm, I'm, 
I've already heard all this. Maybe. There you go. <laughs> this, is not my, this is Christopher Blossom's work. Oh, I I enjoy like his work, and it's very easy to say. I, I don't want to get off track because I want to show and tell you. This guy, okay, has he has a couple of because he brought paintings to show us and all this sort of thing. The first day of the workshop, he comes in and he has a box, okay, and he's talking. He got the he keeps like talking. He's like like tapping the box so everybody wants to know what's in the box, okay. And he's showing this one of these paintings that's like in one of his books. And um, Russell Genation, he's a great uh, gallery, fabulous gallery. And um, <laughs> he used to like be a mile from my house in Connecticut, where the gallery was in Connecticut. I have a very good friend who just stayed with me who's in that gallery. Anyway, he has this box and he says, See this painting? In this box are all the thumbnails I painted for this painting. Mm -hmm. And he opens up the box, and there are, I don't know how many little tiny thumbnails that he has painted of the same painting over and over and over again. There's a reason why he gets $50,000 for the painting, because he's perfected it. When he finally sits down to paint the painting, he knows exactly where he's going. He understands the colors. Yeah. I do that a little bit of that by doing sketches and then the sketches on the canvas, then a real value study, a real value study, which Schmidt, if you were anybody read Schmidt's book? Richard Schmidt. Richard Schmidt. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the books he talks about how to ruin a great value study is to add color to it. How to ruin a great painting, I think, is the line. And it's true, if you do a great value study, you really don't have to add any um, color to it at all. It's a, it made an amazing painting in and of itself. What it does is, as an exercise, when you do the value study, it tells you the positioning of everything, including the shadows and the colors, the depth of range of value, so that you are convinced that the painting actually has a sense of depth. And if you do decent value studies, these are the tools we have. We don't have a lot of them, guys. We really don't. All it takes is Thousands of hours of practice. Okay, I actually heard a speaker, not to change the subject, but I heard a speaker the other day, and he was talking about you know the, is it the thousand hours or ten thousand? Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Yeah, ten thousand hours. And he would say, he said, I'm going to show you something. He said, I've learned how to cut the ten thousand. Yeah. This is one of the speakers on YouTube, and I think it was a TED talk. Yeah, it was a TED talk exactly. And he's he's a clinical psychologist. He has all these doctorates and all this other kind of stuff. And he said. What you do is you learn to self-critique. You know, I do critiques. A um, couple of organizations I've done them for. I used to, I used to get paid to do them, believe it or not, up in Boston. I used to go around and I used to do critique. Even though I used to coach students for um, Brimland, graduate students for painting, believe it or not. Me. I mean, it's like I don't have a degree for being out. And there were several of them that came to me because they wanted to get more realistic. And, um, but anyway, you know, these tools that we have, these are, this is the only tools you've just got to practice. Mm -hmm. The only way you can speed up the process, according to this, this speaker on uh, TED Talk, is to learn to self-critique and to pay attention to it. Like, really focus on, and at the end of it, by the way, he plays, he always wanted to learn to play the ukulele. And he ended up, at the end of the TED Talk, playing the ukulele. He said, this is my 20th hour. And he said, because I learned by reading and all of that. If you learn how to critique, you've got to get friends that can work with you on this. You've got to get people you respect. And you've got to have people that you love to be able to like really want you to grow. Not just stroke you and give you a brownie. You know, you just, you know, go over to their house, have brownie and a cup of coffee. <laughs> you've got to get people who are of a mindset that can really help you. And you know, like, along the way, I've been very, very lucky, like I said. You know, I've had any number of people who have helped me. And um, I literally, my mentor, um, who is a brilliant woman, by the way, um, you know, who just taken, she was more helped me with the world, the creed, the business of art. That's a whole different business. That's a whole different lecture. And, um, but the truth of it is, if you want to be successful and you want to continue to paint, you have to continue to grow. And what you have to do is when you're reading and they suggest that you paint a red ball, Paint it. 
<laughs> when they tell you that they're going to you're going to improve your work if you do a value study, try it in two months. I know you're going to, I know you, and it's like you know, try it. You know, you'd be amazed what you're going to learn. I'm going to tell you. Eight years ago, eight years ago, um, we lived in Venetian Bay. There was a new restaurant that opened up, a little deli. So my son, my daughter-in-law, was at graduate school on stage. They were living in the apartments upstairs. And we used to pick up the kids when we come downstairs. And they were open like two weeks. And he has a whole wall of chalkboard, black chalkboard. And it's for kids to draw. So my grandson was like this big at the time. And I said to him, I said, you want yeah, yeah, to know? You know, paint something for you, uh, to draw something for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get there and I draw this enormous race car on the blackboard. Now, the whole restaurant is in dead silence watching me, okay? <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I have been drawing chalk in this restaurant for eight years. And I am not going to tell you how much I have learned by doing that. Because I don't care. It's just an exercise. I go in with an idea, and by doing that, it just frees me. It's like totally frees me up because when I walk out, I'm not going to see it until I take it down, and I'm going to do the next one. But what I've learned is the color, the value. I do a value study. I do it. I say you should do a value study. Mm -hmm. You should do a value study. And it's like I'm telling you, these these are the little tools that we use to make work work. They really do. And you know what? Get a great book and follow somebody. And I have a guy that I watch. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a YouTube addict. And there's a guy. He's terrific. He's called the Painting Coach. I don't know his name. He's Italian. Right? Young guy. Do I love his work? Yeah. I like my own better. And I don't like a lot of my own work. And um, I like my But the way he words things and the way he explains things are so good. I went out and bought his whole palette of paint. I went out and bought all, every color that he used because he used different colors that I did. And I became religious about doing a bunch of paintings with those colors that I had never used. That, you know what? Out of all of those and all the practice, I didn't end up using any of them. <laughs> That's not what's important. What it is is you learn. You take a little bit from every person that you learn from. And I do this constantly, every night. I'm listening just to get the littlest tidbit. The problem is, as you go up, and the more experience you have, the more hours you have to invest to get that much information. Because you've heard it all. Not to mention, you've probably tried a lot of it. Not all of it, but part of it. Um, who wants to hear my power? Well, you, know, you know, I had a question. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, okay, I'm only standing here because of you. Oh, well, I will be eternally grateful. I'm only here because. I'm not sure, but I might have to give you one of these paintings. I, you know, I'm Whoa. sure you're familiar with uh, Whistler. Of and course. Whistler does some amazing um, landscapes using tonal resonance. Yes. And I see parts of your that you use some of that for atmospheric absolutely effect. but i'm just wondering have you ever done more I, I, I i'll send I, one to you okay i have to have your email address yes okay so i, I listen I, I'd, be, I'd love to see you do a uh, one that is more tonalism use of tonalism Anyways, I just by tomorrow, to say that okay. by tomorrow you will see one oh, i did a series i started doing a series of tonalism i brought it to my the gallery that sells the most work for them he goes, Who's this artist? I'm like, This is a new series it's called Tonalism. He goes, You're not bringing me those, are you? And I'm like, Well, I guess not. <laughs> and it's like, Because, you know, the, the galleries kind of force you, and I hate to say that, they kind of force you. They know what they can sell of you. They sell not only your work, but they sell you. And all of a sudden, you do something completely different. And it's like, even the customers don't accept it. And I I love doing tonalism. I love doing it. And I try to cheat by throwing it in. I see it. I see it. I try to do that. Well, also, the softness of the edges. Edges are another great tool, which we have. No matter what you paint, abstract, tonalism, what do you guys all do? Mixed media. Even that, it's the edges are so important that 
that's what you do. These are all softened edges because it makes you focus right there. I tell you what to look at in the painting. That is your job as the artist, as a matter of fact, to tell people what to look at. Tell you a cute story. Oh, that's my website. Don't believe a word you read. <laughs> and, uh, and, if you, and if you write me on that, I don't look at it all that long. So I don't answer people immediately. Um, I just happened to notice yesterday I had somebody who wrote me in January and they had an answer back. And I'm not a, I don't, I don't, I put new work up just for people to see. It's not a tool, a vehicle that I use to sell at all. I use the galleries to sell. Um, I had, at, at the height, I had 14 galleries. Right now, I have about five. Um, eight more won't be, but I'm like, you know what? I, I'm very happy with the people that I have right now. Um, what was I? I lost my friend. I'm sorry. No, no, I lost my friend. The um, I lose. I do that a lot of my age. Falling off the thing. Oh, I gotta tell you a cute story. I'm in New York. I used to work out of New York. I used to work out of New York. I had an office from the age of 22, and uh, I went into the. I used to, as soon as I had like an hour in my day, I would run down to one of the museums in New York. And then one day I went into the Museum of Modern Art, and I walk in. And you know, I'm very shy if you can't tell. And there's this whole crowd of people standing around this painting, like they do around the Mona Lisa, like they do the girl with the pearl ear. Like they, I'm thinking to myself, oh, damn, this is painting. I gotta go see it. I want to know what this, this painting is. And literally, there was a crowd, you couldn't get near the painting. So I'm I'm very shy. I'm kind of weaving my way through the crowd. And I get toward the front, and it's a painting of a brick. And I'm looking at the brick. It's on its surface. I'm not even going to call it a table. It's just a brick. Oh, a brick. A brick. Yes. Okay. It's, it's a brick. And it's laying on a surface. It has no edges. It hasn't got a tabletop or anything like that. And I am absolutely enamored with this brick. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the most amazing thing I've ever looked at. It's incredible, this brick. I love this brick. Andrew Wyatt painted it. You could see every dimple in the in the in the structure of that brick. You could see what looked like barnacles. You could see all these different things, and it was like, God, this is what makes you good when people just want to stare at what you do. Um, like I said, I've been very lucky in my career, um, and I will tell you, it's interesting. Ninety-nine percent of the paintings that I sell are sold to men, not to women, which is very unusual. But I think a lot of that has to do with the marine subject matter. Yeah, I, do. Um, I think the marine subject matter has a lot to do with that. Uh, but I mean, this is, I mean, a lot of women go to the beach. And so, you know, a lot of people, you know, go to the waterfront. But be that as it may, I think, yes, that does play a role. But it's interesting that the, um, there's something about it that people put, they hide them in their office. You know, they, men are closet collectors, they put them in their office, they put them in their Men's cave and all that sort of thing. When they put it over the fireplace in the living room, so everybody sees it. But um, no, they. Uh, I've had that experience. Any other questions along the way? I don't mind answering questions along the way. What was your very first painting? My very first painting was a still life, and it was of a, a little bear that was my son's, and a watering can that was my grandfather's. It was a still life, okay. and there was something else in the painting. I can't remember what it was. Must be three. It, I'm sorry. It has to be true. I know, but there was a third subject. I can't think of what it was. And I painted it. I painted it. And of course, it was hyper realistic. Hyper, hyper, hyper realistic. And it was a 36 by 36. That's my first painting. And, um, you know, the the whole thing started when my wife and I we used to live on Cape Cod. And of course, I own the company. So it's like, it's like I like taking the day off. Too. Well, I never did. And but if we we don't have like great weather in Cape Cod, I don't want the people from Cape Cod to like you know sue me because of the the business that I'm taking away. But the truth of it is, a lot of rain and it's very cold a lot of the Cape. July and August, perfect, go all you want. But the rest of the year it very can be very iffy. So we had this beautiful day. I don't know. I think it was in the fall. And um, my wife says to me, she goes, "Want to play hooky tonight?" I'm like, "Yeah, we do." And it's like, we went, so we knew the people who owned the, the boats that used to go back and forth to the island. So we jump on the boat, we go over to the Nantucket, we go and got gallery hop, go to the antique shops, and, you know, do all these sorts of things. I come out, and my wife says to me, as only my wife would say, 
Are you okay? I'm like, what? She said, well, you went dead silent, ma'am. <laughs> and I know that that is hard to believe. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, you know, I said, did you see the painting over the fireplace? She said, yes. She said, that is magnificent. I said, I actually would like to buy it. I said, I love that painting so much. I couldn't stop looking at it. And she said to me, she goes, I think we should go. I said to her, right there and then, I said, if I put my mind to it, I could paint that painting. I'd have to go home and I'd have to practice a lot, but I could paint that painting. So my wife being the pragmatist that she is says, I think we should take the early boat home so you can stop painting. <laughs> <laughs> that painting is $17,000. <laughs> the one I wanted to buy. I see the 16 or 17. His name is Donald Journey. J-U-R-N-E-Y. Fabulous painter. Fabulous artist. And I'll tell you, this guy, I've, I've written to him. I've never spoken to him in real life. I've seen his work. I even went into New York to see a retrospective show for his work in New York. He's an amazing artist. I love his work. He changed my life. I mean, it really, really did. I didn't paint at all. I read everything I could read about Donald Journey. I read everything I could possibly read about Christopher Blossom. I read everything that was ever written. I mean, it's like, I took a workshop. The artist will remain nameless. And uh, great guy, great artist. And I walked in, and he opens his box, and he's taking his paints up. He goes, I'm a tomb of black. Oh, I said, that's when Joe McGurl told you to put black in your sky. He's looking at me like, how did you know that? I'm like, because it was in an article and playing a painting. I said in like, you know, 1992. And I said, and I read it. And he said, you're right. He said, that probably is in there from Joe. Joe, Joe McGurl is another one you should know. Right, McGurl, M-C-G-U-R-L. Terrific artist. These are all the people that inspired me. That's why I bring them up. Um, I have to tell you, the work, the work that these people produce is breathtaking. They just... They just cut your breath. And I don't care what gallery, I don't care what subject matter, just go online and look them up. They're just incredible. You know what else is kind of like a thing with me? I love people that are busy. It's like, that means they're producing a lot. There are a lot of people who are very good. They do one painting a year. These boys, like, they've got like 82 galleries. They're doing shows in the Midwest. They're doing shows out West. These are the people I love. These are the people I absolutely adore because these are the people that are learning and just changing all the time. And um, but anyway, be that as it may. Any more questions? How are we doing time? Oh my God. Yes, my pal. I have the loyalty of an alley cat and heat when it comes to my pal. And so, what are you doing? You're waving to me. I'm not waving. He's a guy. Oh, I just oh, wait, what? I'm going to give you the palette. Okay. I, do, I do a long and a cool yellow. Oftentimes, just let me do very secret. I don't share this with everybody. Cadmium yellow. I usually use white. Um, even though I do like hands of hands of yellow. <laughs> then I use um, yellow ochre. I usually use a light yellow ochre. Okay, and these are the colors I used in all of this. I don't use a red. I use a cadmium orange or, I'm sorry, no, cadmium orange or I use uh, vermilion. I love. Oh, by the way, just as a big, big secret, I use Rembrandt paint. And I'll tell you why I use Rembrandt paint. Because it is so transparent. And I like to mix my transparency because, believe it or not, you are actually looking through the gradation of color because of Rembrandt. If you were working with colors, and there's nothing wrong with some of the other paints, but they're more opaque, you can actually create the depth in the color if you have a transparent paint, and red rates are very transparent. And I control that by adding white. So I have two yellows, two reds. Oh, the other one is an aqua Rose. <laughs> I never can say that word. Rose. Then I use I use two greens. I use uh, usually because I live in Florida, by the way, this palette has changed completely since I lived in Florida. I use a yellow, like a bright yellow green. And I use a turquoise. The turquoise it's a, I have a multitude of different phthalo turquoise. Um, I had an artist that came to my house one day, and he's looking at very famous artist. He looked at my, he goes, God, you go with these colors with a whip in a chair. He says to me, look at the intensity of these colors. He didn't, obviously, he doesn't use phthalos. And, um, and then I use two blues, usually cobalt always. 
and then another blue. I'm working on one right now, which is probably what I use here, which is indigo, but I use a darker blue, a very dark blue. Just quick clarification. I don't dare. Jay told me I need to talk to you. Sorry, this is no. Just a quick clarification. I just wanted to make sure too. You kept saying that the light source should come from. No, I didn't say it should. I said. Yeah, okay, whatever. But you said yeah. right and you were pointing. To oh, the left whatever this is. Left. To the left. Over here. Yeah. Over here. So it's yeah. just painting's left, but it's his yeah. right. If, yeah. If, if, well, well, if you. Yeah. If you work with your right arm. Yeah. But I suggest we all go to Herculaneum and look at all the <laughs> together. We should go. Okay. And, uh, and go. Any other questions? Because I'm running out of time. I'm getting people this, reading them. I was just wondering since you seem to be with the I work from a lot of different things. Um, I'm not going to tell you I don't use stuff from YouTube because I do. Um, the things from YouTube, what I do is I never use one paint photograph. It's no, there's no such thing as one photograph to one painting. I mean, I will steal a shrub from a painting if I think it's the right shrub to stick in my painting. Um, you know, the paintings, the things that I do, um, I will work from a multitude of things and borrow them. The reason I had to learn how to do that was because, guess what? These historical boats don't exist anymore. You can't go get pictures of your own to go get them. And when you're painting historical stuff, right. you've got to go to YouTube or books or whatever. I used to buy a lot of books and I used to rip pages out, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, I think you have to get the material from whence it comes. But, you know, I'm not like this. I went up to Connecticut and actually took that photograph. Um, this is, I took that in Bonsville. I can show you the photograph. I, mean, I took that in Bonstable Hub. We used to sit on the porch at night and we'd be having a buck of time. And we'd be sitting there, and Patty's watching me. She'd be staring at me. She'd say, When are we leaving? I'm like, About 10 minutes. I could tell the light was getting right. And we would get in the car and drive as fast as we could to the beaches to go take pictures. And I have thousands of pictures. I had a guy that was in my class. He was an attorney, the president of an insurance company. And he used to, he's a fabulous painter. And he says to me, uh, one day he calls me because I haven't got any inspiration. I said, come on over, go through my box of the photographs. So he comes over, he's sitting in my studio with his phone up, and he's looking at me. He goes, God, you take the worst pictures. <laughs> and I'm like, but there is no such thing as taking one picture and reproducing it, you know, as a painting. You really, you're, uh, you're the artist. You have to, you know, Change and an ensemble. Right? Yes. And I do that myself. Um, I don't do realistic work, but I do. Shame on you. <laughs> Why don't you try? Because I've chosen something different. Okay. I can do realistic work, okay. but I've chosen to That's do fair. something different. But I do try to use my own photography, yeah. but sometimes because of the way I combine images, yeah. surrealistically, yeah. 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 Then, then occasionally I have to find work. Sure. sure. I was just curious. Sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not proud. I'll steal from anywhere. Wait a minute, this lady. Oh, question first. I'm just going to ask you what your thoughts are on the gambling. Um, oh, I use gambling. I use gambling, but I love Rembrandt, and I love Winsor Newton. I'm not proud. I mean, I'm, I think Winsor. I'm Winsor's just thinking of non-toxic and being sensitive. To oh, I don't. I'm toxic. French. I love toxic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm French. It's like you know, you know what? Being French is the greatest thing in the whole world. I'm 100 French. I'm like. The only person I know that's 100% French, even people in France are not 100% French. My wife did a DNA test on me. Oh, no. I'm like, that was a waste of money. The thing came in, and it's like, there's a little dot on the whole world map that big. And that's where I'm from. But every one of my family members came from that little dot in France. And it's so funny, because we've been here for 10 generations. I thought maybe you were French Canadian. No, absolutely not. <laughs> no. Although I will tell you, cute story. I'm running way over time here. No, that's okay. I painted these one. I don't have one here, but I used to paint these dories all the time. These these fishing dories. I used to incorporate them on the beaches. You can go on the website. There's a million of them. Dories. They're the ones that kind of pointed at both ends. They used on fishing trawlers and all of that. I had a relative come one day and they're looking at my paintings. They said, Do you realize you paint what your great grandfather used to build? He owned the biggest manufacturing facility in Canada. 
He was from France. He was born in France. And he tried to get into the United States. And he couldn't get into the United States. So he built a business, okay, in France where all the fishing people from Gloucester, Rockport, and all that used to sail up and get his boats. Put the business out in the United States. Just killed it in the United States. And that's what he, and I had no idea that he did this. I had absolutely Genetic. zero knowledge that he did that. Genetic. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you, it's, you laugh, but somewhere down deep inside, this, and that boat, it just appealed to me, and I just painted it over and over and over again. And, um, you know, it just, who knows? He was feeding you. Someone was feeding <laughs> By the way, he died during the influenza, oh. left all of his children. Each one of them had to trust. None of them had to work. And so, yeah, it's like, you know, they're like, even I don't know. Anyway, those are, those are they, 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 they are. Oh, yeah. Those are they. Yep. Winslow Holmes, I love that. That guy, oh, God. I love Winslow Holmes. I just, yeah. I was so upset the show they had in New York. It was going to cost me like $8,000 to go into New York for like four days. I'm like, I'm going to go to London. I'm going to move it to London. Well, then London, you couldn't get a goddamn ship to take you over there without taking like vaccines and all these other things that you had to do 52 ways from Sunday. So I never did get to see the Winslow Holmes show. And he's like one of my favorites. And you know what I'm going to tell you about Winslow Homer? The real work is so much better. Oh my God. I mean, it is almost impossible to reproduce his work. Last question. You had a question. Well, you say to her, why do you don't paint for an instant? Now I want to find out what is your thinking. You paint realistically. I recognized everything you painted. Uh, that's not my question. Oh, okay, sorry. My question, I'm is, yeah. my question is, what is it that you feel like, uh, about the abstract, about the contemporary? I don't, I love that show. I paint abstract. I actually have some in some of my galleries under another name. Uh, oh. Did he say that? Did I say, no. No. And I actually paint abstract. I love abstract. I adore it, as a matter of fact. But, I think if you learn how to do realism, you're going to bring that knowledge to your abstract. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to help oh, you. It, to be able to paint abstract, you have to learn from the beginning. Exactly. So that's what but I'm basically abstract saying. abstract is completely different in the order of the realism. Well, so is watercolor. So is watercolor. Is so is all of these things are completely different. Watercolor. You paint with watercolor. I used to teach, I taught for years. And I taught only adults. And I could tell the minute I watched somebody paint, I want to that's a work colors. Because they you work backwards. You do the big brush stroke, and then you do the tinting, you get the glow, and then you start putting in the details, you know, yes. that sort of thing. Watercolor is paint very differently. But the acrylics also you say that you have over here transparent. But Gordon has transparent, translucing oh, yeah. on ink and so forth. I know. And he's uh, acrylic. I know. I know. I have acrylics. I have a, my wife and I have a bunch of every year we, for art. And I have some beautiful acrylics in my house. Right. Anything else? else? Mm -hmm. Going once? Mm -hmm. Going twice? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for uh, being here and sharing the wonderful art. Mm -hmm. That one wasn't too boring. Oh, that wasn't too boring. No, no, I don't no. think so. I don't think so. I think so. Waterford, and there's other and there's um, other uh, artists in here in North of Waterford. But I uh, took the um, I have a BA in art, and one of the things we had to learn was the value of scale. Yes. Uh, and I found at the beginning, of course, I went and kicking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm a photographer, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. But I actually learned that through the value of scale, yes. that I'm able to see light in yes. such a, a way that yes. now I know that's not really wise. Right, you know, so, right, right. Um, so I think it's important for anybody in any medium and any uh, to learn these scales and to really learn them and and, and to even take other uh, to practice out. Pra exactly. A form of photographer should definitely yeah. try painting, do a value study. Exactly. I mean, that's what. No, I, I totally agree because then you'll definitely see. You'll definitely change yeah. your. Um, your eyes yes. will see yes. how the light and the radiation of color yep. when you go to a, 
take the photographs yourself. Um, now I'm taking photographs because I want that as my end product. Right. Right. You're taking photographs because you want to use them right. Right. <laughs> in, in regards to that. So it, it, it is a different, but you do have to use color theory, principles of design, composition, everything that you um, um, spoke to us today. So this is really amazing work. I love it. It's beautiful. It's um, and I think the most important, it does have that emotional appeal that we spoke about that um, is important for all art mediums from abstract to art to uh, everything needs uh, emotional appeal for your audience, right? So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Kate, for inviting